is the main reason why if I started a company myself, it'd be nothing but bitches. Like, everywhere the eye can see, nothing but bitches. <laughs> because we get shit done. Anyway. Speaking of bitches who get shit done. Yeah, Nettie Akorafor, Tana Ford, and James Devlin. What a transition. <laughs> All right, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to Girls Talk Comics. This is your lieutenant of literature. No, wait. I'm the master of mediocrity. <laughs> I'm Aaron. <laughs> I'm the mom host. <laughs> I'm the lol host. This is, this is Jessica, yeah. your lieutenant of literature. So we're going to talk about LaGuardia today. And um, what's really great is we have about 30 minutes of recorded material of us complaining about ageism in workplaces and uh, increased workloads. So, but you came to Girls Talk Comics and not Girls Talk Shitty Workplaces. Uh, however, if you're interested in that, you can always hit us up on our social media on Facebook or Twitter, and we will gladly exchange stories or kind of give a rough, anonymous telling of our own. Yeah. But we're here to talk about LaGuardia, written by Nettie Okorafor and drawn yes. by Tana Ford, colored by James Devlin. So this is a Hugo and Nebula Award winner. Um, Nettie is famous for her resurgence almost like she just came in like a wildfire and took the whole community by storm with these amazing neo afrofuturistic takes in the ya and adult fantasy both of uh sci-fi and fantasy and just really creating beautiful lush intriguing unique takes on old tropes and genres she has written this graphic novel called LaGuardia, and LaGuardia is an airport in New York City that a lot of international flights go through. The premise of this is a commentary on illegal aliens, but they're actually aliens, mm -hmm. but also sometimes not aliens. So it's it's a very timely look at, I think it was a response to He Who Must Not Be Named's travel ban from mm. oh god it seems like seems like forever ago now but talking about like how the world as it is now would respond basically to something like contact <laughs> with the others right like these like the, the ufos right. and stuff are actually real they show up and they've actually got this thriving economy and everybody wants to come see what's up with the new world and she makes a very strong point in her little forward that this is not a dystopian future this is just a future not so far afield from where we are now where aliens happen to yeah. exist like extraterrestrial aliens happen to exist yeah so no, it's really fun it's lush and i think it centers on some nigerian americans and their transit back and forth between america and nigeria where N nigeria is sort of like basically where they've opened their borders and they've rolled out the welcome mat and they understand you know transit peoples and and have really like taken the utopic version of this but we see very quickly that they aren't quite utopic there's still people who disagree but they're just not indulged in the same way that the people who disagree in america are you know, so that kind of sets the stage for this novel, I think. Like, so Nettie herself is a Nigerian American. She is the children. Uh, she is a child <laughs> of uh, Nigerian immigrants to the United States, and so she's had this really interesting experience growing up. I found this great interview off of her website, just to list my source, where she talks a little bit about going between Nigeria and the United States and kind of that experience, both in regards to racism and how, you know, she was experienced, she saw tribalism in Nigeria, but experienced racism in the United States, and just how difficult it was. She talked a little bit about how she saw technology start to show up in Nigeria. And that really kind of helped framed a lot of her, I think a lot of the work. Uh, for example, she's talking about how Nigeria had cell phones before running water in a lot of places mm -hmm. like everybody had a phone and could call people but no internal plumbing so it was just really like kind of a cool concept and you can see it in here and because I, I remember looking at the beginning and you're when you're following citizen at first 
and he's driving down the street and everything is like a self-control car but then you, he's got like holographic cell phones but then people are still like panhandling in the middle of the street and I thought that was kind of an interesting oh, yeah. contrast and really really great okay I'm so glad I actually sat down to read it I talked to you about this a little bit but like I don't I don't know what it is about pregnant characters like our main character future is pregnant and that is just like an experience or a mindset that I don't relate to. Like I looked at it and I was like, this is a book about pregnancy and I'm so not interested. And I was so wrong. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's definitely a book like about family and roots and it talks a lot about refugee and again, that immigration home experience and that's not pregnancy. And I'm, I was so much more engaged than I thought, but like, just looking at the cover, I was like, oh God, no, not babies. And I've, I've never been so glad to be wrong. Yeah. I will say that boldly and with pride. I have a history of being turned off by pregnancy as well. I feel like this is something that I, I see a lot in the fan fiction community. I'm using that as a microcosm to sort of talk about the fact that I think a lot of women do not like interested in to actively triggered by the idea of pregnancy. And I'm not sure 100% why that aspect was important to the author, because it wasn't really the focus of the book, you know, it, other than just being a motivator for the character to get out of the situation she was in. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it had to do with like the idea of connectivity and like how the people who are around us can impact our family for generations like I'm reading into it I, there was nothing really explained in the interviews but I'm wondering if it's also kind of an additional metaphor for her immigrant experience and her being a child of an immigrant experience because like a future isn't of herself an immigrant and I think she has a pretty extended African family they don't talk a lot about mm -hmm. her family outside of her grandmother and her parents but her child future citizen uh, Liv is kind of that example of where human life and the alien life are now mingling and creating a new experience like it's representing I think that mm -hmm. I think maybe I'm totally reading into it I'm not an expert but uh, it it feels kind of like that. Yeah. Here's the next generation in this immigrant telling of this mixture of these two cultures that I have to kind of work together and a, a coming together, a, like a good coming together and how it's going to affect future generations. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. And then use a lot of that imagery on like the, the chapter pages, right? Like, so they have. I think those were the issue mm -hmm. covers they have embedded in this. So, like, the first one you see is her holding her belly, kind of sitting cross-legged with this sentient plant you meet later, uh, sort of holding her to the ground and surrounding her lovingly. And then, like, the second chapter, you see her marching in, in front of a protest uh, against the travel ban, and she's got a big baby on board sign on her, on her belly, and I think that's actually the one that they use on the cover of the trade back as well trade back trade paperback i think we should call them trade backs sure anyway she doesn't actually get involved with that protest you find out ha having read it but it like it's i think it's just a visual sort of identifier and then chapter three has this really interesting one uh where she's holding a seed in her pregnant belly basically like it's like you see a seed inside mm -hmm. of her belly and she's sort of like held up with her dread, with her locks, sorry, dreadlock is a pe pejorative, uh, her locks looking like helixes, like double DNA helixes, sort of in this very snaky pattern, uh, with this ghost of her oh, shit. future husband citizen kind of dwelling behind her. And sh it, so it's kind of like within her, she holds the key or the seed to sort of draw together this tribalist man that she loves on an individual level and kind of bring him into this accepted, intertwined experience that she is supporting and behind with her grandmother and mm -hmm. that home full of extraterrestrials, basically. You mm -hmm. know, so I get, like, a lot of the symbolism in this book is pretty much on the nose, right? Like, the, the, the plant puts down roots, yeah. that's important. And the outside extraterrestrial aliens are giving of themselves their technology and DNA to help people with disabilities and with, like, technology, like, Nigeria was was given a lot of technology and, and kind of helped bring them into the future. And, you know, like, you see a lot of 
this idea of the mothers bringing all of that together and creating something new. So I get that a little bit, but at the same time, like within the actual action, other than, you know, the fact that she has to have the baby eventually, (laughs) you don't see it. I don't know. Like the main focus really is, you know, the fight that they're doing to try to protect the found family instead of the one that they were born to. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's great that it's not just about motherhood and intergeneration, but they actually talked about identity in that interview. And Mm -hmm. I think of course, Nettie's own words are going to give herself more credit than any paraphrasing I can do. If people want to go find that interview, uh, I guess we could drop a link and then below this, I could do that. Yeah. But the interviewer brings up the idea of identity and I love her response. (laughs) Because she does talk to that, but then she also says the main characters will always be special because the power of narrative. (laughs) So like her main (laughs) characters are going to always be special because she's writing them. And I thought that was kind of cool, but Mm -hmm. she has an awareness and she writes to that awareness Because that's the stories that she's heard. That's the story that she lived. The interaction between her identities of that outside inside thing about being Mm -hmm. an outsider and being an insider at the same time and how that creates it. I just think the entire story has these underpinnings of themes that she talks about racial and gender equality, political violence, environmentalism, genocide, friendship, risk taking, ancient wisdom, and just kind of this, you know, again, she doesn't want a dystopian future. And I thought that was really, really cool because all of our stories about aliens, it's always alien invasion, inv- alien invasion, alien invasion. But they have these lever, mm-hmm. these, uh, yeah, lever books. Is that what they're called? Lever's Guide, where it's the people who are leaving their planet and going to. And there's a Mm -hmm. really cool line in the last one that you see, just like the entire way that it's written is it's just so hopeful and so like a tourist mag and I freaking love it. But one of the lines that really stood out to me, you must also be also prepare for Earth's many quaint uh, staples, I guess. The, a thumb covers it, so you can't really see it. You'll first peoples? encounter the I indigenous think it's known as human beings. Oh, peoples. Okay. I put staples. I don't know why, because I'm like, apples are a staple. <laughs> anyway. You'll first encounter the in- indigenous known as human beings upon leaving your spacecraft. They are marvelous, full of energy, spirit, and confusion. Reports inform us that Zenaria travelers should be cautious, careful, and polite. But I just thought that was really kind of an interesting way to frame it of just humans are marvelous, full of energy, spirit, and confusion. Like it's an honest, but in a kind way of like, they are Mm -hmm. people who will be suspicious of you and they are confused about all these changes, but there's still a goodness and a wonder to them. And I just thought that was such a different way to frame it rather it being, you know, be on edge, be prepared. Because even at conversations whenever we travel abroad are always like, you're going to get mugged. <laughs> like, don't drink the water. Yeah. Don't do this, this, this. It's like, it's all a bunch of don'ts and not a bunch of do's. And like, I was just thinking about my time traveling abroad. And though there are some serious warnings that should be had. If you don't speak the language, don't go by yourself to a lot of places in large city areas when you noticeably stand out like be cautious when you're an outsider but i still would have preferred some stuff about like hey the people you're going to are mostly going to just ignore you they see a lot of Mm -hmm. americans you're fine yeah okay that's good to know like that that would have set me in a whole different degree of suspicion and on edgedness if somebody was just like don't really go alone to certain areas because you're a tourist this is going to be a way that you're going to be targeted and just do your thing politely and respectfully you know yeah so that's that's what really stuck out to me i really did enjoy a lot of it really fun fact about LaGuardia though is it does take place in the same universe as her book Binti, uh oh, really Corfor's book Binti. it's just about i think a hundred years before the book yeah I, I got that from... Now I gotta go reread Binti. Emerald City Comic Con 2019 interview. I've never read it. This is actually really? my first Nettie Akorafor title. I have Binti and like, it's really Phoenix good. right here. And I, I actually, I read Nettie before I read Octavia B. Butler. And then I immediately like dove into a bunch of Octavia stuff as well because she also has the same. I find that I really enjoy like mysticisms that I haven't encountered before. Like I, I was always really drawn to like Greek and Roman mythology. Well just Greek mythology with like the Roman being an unfortunate side effect of the Greek mythology. But um <laughs> you know, and like yeah. Egyptian mythology, like Egyptian mythology as well. And I and I 
I've mm-hmm. flirted with Christian mythology sometimes because it's just so pretty and cinematic, but I haven't really been exposed yeah. to a lot of this this kind of background, you know, like any any like African or like very limited East Asian, you know, like Chinese, sure, maybe right. a little bit Japan more so. But, you know, even Indian, like, I'm very interested in, in learning more about those other backgrounds that didn't get as much press whenever I was in high school. And I just got Goodreads. <laughs> okay, yeah. side note, I just got Goodreads. And so I was going through and reading a whole bunch of books to try to figure out, like, what the fuck I had read. And I was looking back, and my poor little, like, library in high school, it had a lot of really good books, but it was just such a limited perspective. And I like, was starting to realize that as I was sort of writing all of these books and all these scholastic things came up and I was just like oh look how limited my poor little rural school was giving me they were giving me a lot of Greek stuff they were giving me a lot of like white old men sci-fi authors they were giving me a lot of female YA authors but they were all white as well you know and like yeah wow this is sad I wish this wasn't the way it was but it's what they heard about you know and I'm glad I'm glad that now we have that technology and the interconnectedness to be able to sort of break through that a little bit and also we're giving more space for people with minority voices like Nigerian Americans or you know, like Mm -hmm. Chinese Americans to really flourish in a field, you know, I like it. I dig it. You know, I, more in the future. You're right about that. But I think Nettie dug out her own space for it and was going to take no victims or like no, no prisoners. She was like, I am coming for it (laughs) and I am excelling to such a degree. I mean, she's won every freaking award essentially. Like she's so good. And uh, like, like she doesn't have to be this good. Like, she should just get the recognition anyway. So, cool thing about her that I learned in an interview. Like, I'm sorry that we haven't talked at all about Tana Ford, and we totally can. But Nettie, so, Nettie used to be an athlete. Like, a really, like, top-tier tennis player. She went in to have surgery one day for a scoliosis issue was told there was a 1% chance of being paralyzed afterwards and was part of that 1%. So she went, she walked in, to, to quote her, she walked into the hospital, woke up nine hours later and couldn't move, couldn't feel half of her body. So she started writing as a way of surviving that and recovering from that. And like, wow, I, you know, it's one of those things that more than anything, I wish that hadn't happened to her. So, she, you know, she could have, not experience that but at the same time she's such a stellar writer and now i've said that again this is the first thing that i've read from her but like i'm really i mean i'm impressed like i want to go read the binti book now and Mm -hmm. read more of it i really appreciate people like her who have trailblazed you know because i feel like because people like octavia Mm -hmm. butler and are doing what they're doing now that they are that like, you know, maybe they weren't given space willingly, but now maybe others are given space more willingly in order to excel and bring more voices to the field. And I feel like we were talking a little bit about fan culture before we started, and I feel like all of the hard conversations, it's important. I know that those were some of the first conversations I was exposed to on my path to anti-racism and you know, busting through my own white feminism and trying to learn and expand more past that. And that was because somebody, like, people in this hobby that I cherish deeply, you know, like, came in with voices that I was very interested in and loved loved experiencing. And it cannot be minimalized how much more, how exponentially greater it is for people who are within the same minority as these authors and artists who... Like, you know, whatever small contact high I'm getting, they're probably getting an atomic bomb's worth of inspiration and hope oh, yeah. from this. Yeah. Just exponentially greater. And it's actually giving me physical chills right now thinking about, like, how important it is for these women. Because, like I said, I lived in this rural community, but I was able to experience a bunch of female YA authors because that was something that had breached into my rural experience. And like that was very important for me. Mm-hmm. That was extremely important for me. And and I can just I can just barely representation fathom, matters. Like, yeah. Yes, it does. Representation really, really matters. And you know, like Nettie, this kind of gets to this complicated thing of like, does somebody need to be an exemplary artist to be recognized or to really validate representation? And I think no. 
I think any representation, any representation from a creator of the group is amazing. Like, like that's, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's the same complicated thing. I think for us, when it comes to seeing women in media, there's like, we want to see more well-rounded women characters, lady type characters. And I would, I would imagine it's the same for black women, black men and Nigerian American immigrants and their children. And Nettie definitely provides that. And I'm, glad that's her focus and it almost seems in an uncompromising way and that is where I, she should really be respected and cherished is just she's coming out she's speaking her truth she's speaking the stories that she hears and wants to share and probably lived she just also happens to be really really good at it so it's like mm-hmm. uh, and that's that's the yeah. point i want to make of like she's telling stories and that's what's important and then separate from her stories she's just really really talented because i don't i don't want to create the idea that she has to write exceptional stories for it to be valid no 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 the stories need to be told regardless and you're just gonna have good yeah. ones at first like you're gonna have better written than and worse written stories and that's fine that's inevitable she just also happens to be really good <laughs> like, right there's something to be said about the fact that that is how we are most willing to allow space for people who are not the quote-unquote like normative of that space right like anytime we're opening doors for minorities oh, yeah. and stuff i say we but i mean like culture as a whole you know it really does help grease the wheels because otherwise it's a long drawn out fight and depending on how long that fight is or how harsh it is you know they they become there they're, there can be generated stereotypes like uh how female comedians aren't as funny like women aren't funny you know Ugh, things like that yeah. where you know when people are struggling and working and pushing and even that is used against them so like i really appreciate when that not only do we get really good stories but also whenever they just sort of shut that shit down you know like when people excel Mm -hmm. i just am so happy for them because they're not only are they doing this for them but they're also just laying this foundation where it's like yeah okay you can say what you want to say but look at the receipts you know (laughs) like and (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, I, I I really do. I don't know. Everybody likes an underdog story. And I think a little bit of that is is feeding into sort of my fervor about like, no, but she's also awesome. You know what I mean? Like, I just, yeah. I can't imagine like how hard it is to break into this as not just, you know, like a woman or as someone who's just completely new to the field, but also just like just a modern person. I, I think there's just so many things that are just you know, fears that we fight putting ourselves out there in the public view. And and anytime somebody has sort of that strength of character to do that and to represent themselves in a public space with, you know, what could potentially be a whole lot of people rooting against them. I don't know if I already said this, but I did have to do like a history lesson after reading this because there were a lot of unknown terms, new terms. So I... You know, I grew up in American history classes. I don't know much about African history. It's never really been a focus of mine. Not, like, consciously. It's almost as if, the ex- like, it never crossed my path in any mm-hmm. way. Like, if if I experienced something African, it was always done in such an American context that I never, like, it never prompted me to ask more questions and do more research. Does that make sense? Yes. I can, I can, okay. let me just say, cool. the only experience that I had with African history is we did a module on genocide. So we watched Schindler's List and then not too long after we watched Hotel Rwanda. And that is, that is the extent of the African history I got that's, in primary yeah, school. That's kind of mine too. And for me, I went to a really progressive high school where instead of it, us talking about necessarily the African experience and African history, we talked about it in the context of American slavery and American racism, which is mm-hmm. very important for my perspective, for my window, because I, I am an American. And that relationship with my my relationship with Africa as a white American is most likely racism and you know the the echoes of slavery so that framing never made me look at Africa and how it currently is it's always how did people I'm potentially related to kind of fuck up the country the countries the continent and yeah practice human trafficking and so so like anyway the long story short of that is <laughs> 
I did a little, I had to do a little bit of research to understand some of African history and kind of the tribalism and conflict there. Like Biafra was a state in Western Africa that lasted for about two and a half, three years where the Igbo tribe like <clears throat> tried to pull away and create their own state. And it, so it was very, like I did a lot of research and I found a lot of different things. And Nettie, if you ever hear this, thank you for unintentionally expanding my world to include more African history. You know, you mentioned how yours was sort of, your, your African history was sort of like through the context of American slavery. And I'm assuming you guys talked about the triangle you know, the slavery triangle route or whatever, because that was basically yeah. what mm -hmm. they focused on whenever I was in school. And I remember very starkly, sort of, we did get a little bit about tribalism and the problems they're in. Because I mean, that's kind of the focus of Hotel Rwanda as well. But um, it's such like looking back on it, it's so gross and icky thinking about that and that experience because um. You know, like, I just remember, I can almost call up the face of our teacher as he's like, guess who sold the slaves to the white guys? The other tribes. Yeah. I just remember that. And I'm just like, oh, gross. You know, like, what a gross perspective to have. Yeah. Like, that you're like, almost, you know, it wasn't just us. It's like, Ugh. yeah, yeah. You're almost still smug doesn't about make it. it. Okay. And it's like, this is it. Like, this is all bad. Like, nope. You know. This is gross. Like, any person that's touching this history is is left tainted by it. You know what I mean? Like, this is not... An ex yeah. Like, their like, bad actions do not absolve you of your bad actions. You know? Like, that's not how the world right. works. Right. You know, like, like the, there are so many situations where human traffickers are still punished, even if you just bought the human that was being trafficked. Like, that. that's still... Mm -hmm. Like, you're still participating in an atrocious diabolical act like there's nothing <laughs> yeah well, they sold them like and you bought them like what no like that's not how that works like you know like yeah bro no uh, uh we we still have the after effects it, it doesn't matter who started it what matters is that yeah there's who still rampant, it? rampant systemic racism like it's it doesn't doesn't matter we've created an entirely new situation we have to come to terms with it knowing where it started that it did start with a transatlantic slave trade that it did start with horrible like horrible acts it it now we have to come to terms with it today and how it's impacting today and there's nothing about legislation that gave mostly equal federal rights but that doesn't change the fact that realtors still persecute people based on their race and the color of their skin. It doesn't change the fact that mm -hmm. schools and social services create hoops that target people who are trying to prevent the people who need the services from accessing them. Like we, you can't say, well, slavery ended or Martin Luther King fought for rights when people are still being fired for natural hairstyles. Like that's like, Bro, you know, mm -hmm. it's still here. <laughs> like, like, let's not, let's not be naive about it. Like, it's... Yeah. And I will say that this book does a good job of not just masking racism by using extraterrestrials. I see that so often. I mean, like, that is, that is the traditional way that science fiction handles That's this, right? True. Like, they just go, oh, it's okay. Like, yeah. like, humans are all equal, but those alien monsters, you know, and that's supposed to be sort of the vehicle through which we talk about modern racism, or even, like, 70s racism or whatever. Oh my god. Yeah, there's actually a really cool line about it when she's going through the LaGuardia airport, and they're asking her all these questions about, like, oh, so you're Nigerian-African. Are you, or American, are you going to come here as a birther? Are you going to have your baby here so that your baby can be a citizen? And they're like, what's your DNA? Are you sure your baby's human? And all this stuff. Well, she mm -hmm. has an illegal alien in her bag. And like, yeah, the, the line about they're so focused on the normal that they miss the abnormal because uh, Nettie talks about it in the um, end of the trade paperback. She mentions like how when she went through the LaGuardia airport, they were so focused on her on her locks that they didn't notice her can of pepper spray in her bag. And so it was right. The line um, fear and racism have their uses. I just thought that was like, wow. Yeah. That was such a, like a prestidigitation. Look at my le right hand while I'm picking your pocket with the left kind of yes. thing. It was just such a magic trick 
And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, right? I would never even gone there with that. But, you know. I hate this narrative where, like, I don't want to lean into that, like, we're using your racism against you thing. Because it sounds an awful lot like something that I hate. Like, I, I'm not saying, like, this is what that is doing. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying, like, yeah, I like it. It's a good flavor to add. But I don't want to see this in, like, a billion books. Especially, I don't want to see this in books, like, written by, like, white people, uh, specifically. Like, people can use their own experiences how they want to in, in art. But I don't want other people to sort of latch onto that as something they can now write about in their science fiction. Because um, it sounds oh, awful totally. like, like that whole white men talking about like oh women are the real power because they use this subjective force in the bedroom or they they rule the house so they are actually the people the neck that turns the head this whole like thing that women have internalized for centuries like i don't want that kind of power because that's dangerous but i want this insight like it sounds kind of like yeah like i don't want people outside the community to try to use that theme as something that they they're like now okay to like use because anytime i hear a dude go yeah but her power was the different kind of power i'm like oh vomit like no <laughs> yeah stop Just oh stop. yeah fortunately that only <laughs> happens like once and then every other time like they can't they don't even try to use that again and it, right it's, yeah it's such a tactic that's too risky to use because it's exactly some point, yeah when it doesn't work you're, the fallout of it not working mm-hmm. it's that's not a valid tactic and yeah yeah um which is the same issue i have with that whole like neck that turn the head thing yes you're right it's the same issue because it's not a valid like argument it's not a valid tactic but let's talk about something like hella fucking cute okay yes so i was watching an interview with tana ford the Ooh. artist who is by the way a part of this <laughs> Yes, there is an artist in for a comic. <laughs> Weird. Never heard of that before. So, uh, and she, of course, has asked, what's the work process? Because I think a lot of people are really curious about how artists and writers interact. And she was talking about, in some of her experience, like, quoted another writer that she worked with who was like, yeah, these two characters fight. There's an uppercut and a kick. I don't know, just have fun with it. And, but Nettie was not that type, which also has its benefits because like Nettie apparently was sending like picture references and stuff to Titana and she was like, heck yes, send me pictures because what she could you can also do with pictures is send them to the colorist and be like, this is your reference, right? So Nettie found sea sheep and sea sheep are these cute as heck little sea slugs. They're also called oh. leaf slug or leaf sheep. They're very, very adorable. They are the tiny blue-green aliens that are in the beginning of the book and on the cover of the trade. They are; Those are the cutest little things, and I love them. Cause, so when you're first introduced to the scene, you're like, of course, you, you meet Citizen first, and he's trying to find Future, the main character. And then you see this ship, and the ship is landing in LaGuardia, and you're getting kind of introduced to... New York in the landing and you see it's a sleek design fantastic perspective and you think the ship is so much bigger and out from mm-hmm. it comes these little blue green adorable like sea sheep aliens and they're walking out and you have you're not questioning anything you're like oh great beautiful wonderful and then they're walking and they're not taller than a human's foot and it's just like mm-hmm. it, like I saw them and I was like oh those are kind of cute a little maybe uncomfortable with them being human sized, and then I see them no taller than someone's foot, and I am just devastated. And then they pull out, and you see them walking from the ship, and the ship is so tiny compared to everybody else standing there. And I'm like, this is the best introduction. Like, if this gets adapted into some kind of screen thing, movie, or show, that is the opening shot. They need to keep it frame for frame. Like, they just need to keep that same perspective. Yes work going on because that that is just cute and it sets you up for the fact that this is a book that's not going to be focused on dystopian fear it's so just i don't know it's precious like it is precious and you know what it reminded me of it reminded me of the men in black scene when the main baddie tentacle like alien thing comes out and it's less it's like an itty bitty thing like barking at a dog (laughs) <laughs> definitely with aliens well, so much like, fun. i love that perspective shot with yeah. aliens like yeah because you have a frame and you and then it's not it's not that that's what we're gonna get about tana ford 
Yeah. So. Good job. I will say it took me a little bit to really like come around to her art style. And I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it was just too shiny for me. I don't know. Like, like the, the way they have like a bunch of extra gloss on some of the, some of the front bits. And then I get into the middle of it and it's got this very, mm-hmm. very bold coloring. You know, like the coloring is very bold and, you know, like it's not a traditional comic art style like sometimes it is but other times it's not it was just very confusing for me to sort of get my head around there's a lot going on in it and so it's kind of but i I mean i get what you're saying but there's this book has a lot of detail they she can do her scenery shots in her detailing really really well so i this isn't the art style that would have like immediately grabbed me but I think it works with the story, and oh yeah, no, I fell in love yeah, with it by about end of chapter one. Yeah, but the first chapter was rough. I had, I kind of, I think I had to get used to the aliens first before I understood what was really going on. Because when you meet Citizen, he's just sur- surrounded by plants, and so I was just trying to wrap my head about like, what is that? What is you know? What's the context? Like I knew to look for aliens, but. The design, the florals were just so alien, but I'm sh- that <laughs> it took me a little while to get it and to understand it. Well, there was just a lot. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot going on with the with the extraterrestrial aliens, but then there's also a lot going on with you know, like just sentient plants are just so bright. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I felt more comfortable when we got to the American homes and stuff. I think I really like was able to sort of leave the background in the background, if that makes sense. Like, I was a little visually overloaded, kind of like you were the first time you watched, like, watched Red Monstrous, you know? Like, I was just visually mm-hmm. overloaded a little bit before I could really settle into what was happening with the action and stuff. And I, and thankfully, that first chapter yeah. really does focus on the background, so you you don't... It, it, it worked. But I, can we just talk about those sentient plants a little bit? Because I know there was, there was only one really graphic scene in this, and it was when citizen gets driven out of his country by the radicalist group that he used to be a part of oh yeah oh that broke my heart yeah you didn't know any of the plants individually like you do for let me live which is the cutest name for a little sentient plant ever but there was just it was it was a little bit heart-wrenching whenever you you read it and you were like oh no like he had all of these refugee sentient plants that were because like apparently the sentient plants don't fuck with each other you know like they're a little microcosm of tribalism like within this one overarching style of extraterrestrial like they all are sort of similar enough to hate each other i guess which is a good metaphor like that's good i like that that reads well to me uh probably because Nettie does have such good backgrounds on what that actually looks like and how that performs so she was able to sort of transplant that a little bit but um bump I did it this time, too. Um, <laughs> anyway, isn't that bad? I'm sorry. <laughs> but when when I saw that house go up, it was just really, it was like, oh, no. Because I was thinking I was going to get through this book about these really terrible things without having anything graphically terrible shoved in my face. And I was like, God, this is very effective. Nope. And it wasn't, gra- it wasn't graphically terrible. It was effective, but it was still heart-wrenching. And yeah, that was great. And just mm-hmm. and just to circle back a little bit to let me's name on the on the face value, it's just such a it's such an on the nose book kind of. But then like the more you sit and think about it and process it and talk about it on a podcast, you realize all the small things that are just sort of just coming out from behind you and smacking you on the head. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I thought that was kind of a fun little component of it. But we should talk about recommended reading style. I mm-hmm. think it's a book that'll be easier to find in trade paperback. For I sure. did not feel that reading in the trades, I missed anything. So I recommend it as mm-hmm. a trade, a collection if people want. Did you read it as a collection or did you read it in individual issues? Yeah, I read it trade back. I'm making that work. It's going to be it's going to be a thing. I'm going to make fetch work. Uh so yeah, I read okay. it in trade back, but I think that the Going back to, like, the art style a little bit and the coloring, I think you could totally buy an electronic copy of this. It felt kind of electronic to me reading it, like, the way it was printed. So I I don't think you would miss anything if you just, like, bought this electronically, if that's your jam. You don't have a place to go buy books locally that doesn't support the man. You you might just 
cut down on consumerism and buy it electronically. I don't know if that's any less consumerist. It's just more like minimalist staining, I guess. I don't know. I need to reevaluate the way that I think about that, I guess, because owning things is still owning things, even if it's in the ether. Oh. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think you could do it in ease <laughs> as well. <laughs> Fair enough. I just recommend people read it if they want. Go to your damn library and rent it. Yeah. Make your library buy it. There you go. Fuck yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you for joining (laughs) us today. We will see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Uh, Hint to you, the author's name is pronounced Nettie. Nettie. Acorafor. Acorafor. Nettie Acorafor. Like Eddie with an N on the front. We're keeping that.